On today's episode of the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, we speak to Dr. Jeff Jarvis, the EMS Medical Director for Williamson County EMS and Marble Falls Area EMS in Central Texas. We discuss cardiac arrest for every physician, from pathologist to podiatrist. He teaches us how to identify and manage a cardiac arrest if we happen to be the medical professional on the scene. We cover multiple circumstances, from the woods to the mall to a plane. And after this talk, you'll feel better equipped to know what to do and what you can't do in those circumstances. Dr. Jarvis maintains his clinical practice at Baylor Scott and White Hospital in Round Rock, Texas. He's board certified in both emergency medicine and emergency medical services. He began his career in EMS over 30 years ago, has worked in three states as a paramedic, retains his active paramedic license today. He teaches extensively and has offered multiple articles on EMS issues in both peer-reviewed and industry journals. His research interests include airway management and clinical performance measures. He discusses EMS research on his podcast, EMS Lighthouse Project Podcast, and I strongly recommend you check it out. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Jeff Jarvis, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So we're going to talk about cardiac arrest for the non-specialist, right? For, for doctors who don't typically see it, but might find themselves in a situation outside the clinical arena where they're going to be looked at because they're the only doctor around. So for the pathologist that doesn't have his microscope, for the ENT that doesn't have his otoscope, right? What, what do we do? So we're going to give a couple of scenarios. We're going to go from the, the arena where you have the least accoutrement at your disposal to, to more. So we're going to start with, you're a pathologist, you're 15 years out from residency, you're on a camping trip with some of your friends, and one of them clutches his chest and collapses. You're the only doctor. So everyone looks at you knowing full well that you don't have your H&E stain, you don't have your microscope. <laughs> So what do you do? Let's start with the physical exam. What am I, what am I examining this person for? Absolutely. So I think the, the key thing, the scenario that we're given is that we sort of know the answer, right? It's all like on M&M. We don't discuss an M&M if all things went well. So we know this is going to end up in a cardiac arrest. But the poor pathologist who's out hunting with his friends doesn't know that. He just knows he collapsed. So he has an undifferentiated patient. And what he needs to determine is whether he's actually in cardiac arrest or not. And the way we do that, what we traditionally taught is that you do the shake and shout, you assess breathing for like 30 minutes, and then you assess for a pulse for another 30 minutes. I exaggerate slightly, but there were these long periods of time where you would try to feel for breathing and a pulse. And what a fair amount of research has been done in telecommunicator CPR, so the 911 responder who is, or the 911 dispatcher who's trying to determine whether the patient on the other side of the phone is in cardiac arrest, as well as with trained responders, what we've determined is that we're miserable at feeling for pulse. And I think we probably know that when we're trying to feel a pulse, well, do they have a pulse? Do they not? I don't know. Well, that's because that's dependent on their blood pressure. So if they have, it's hard to tell the difference between cardiac arrest and a low output state. So where we have ultimately ended up is you check for responsiveness. Are they awake? Are they responding to pain? And then you say, are they breathing normally? So the distinction between breathing normally and moving air at all is important because one of the natural processes of going into cardiac arrest, particularly sudden cardiac arrest, where you're walking along just fine, your LED occludes, you go into V-fib and arrest, is that you try to, your body naturally tries to decrease thoracic pressure to increase your preload. And you do that by gasping and you have these agonal respirations. Well, if you ask someone, particularly who doesn't see this all the time, are they breathing? Well, yeah, they're moving air, but they're not breathing normally. And the agonal movement isn't really doing a whole lot effectively. So 
are they awake? Are they responsive? And are they breathing normally? And if the answer to those questions is no, then you begin chest compressions. We've really de-emphasized trying to do mouth to mouth or any sort of ventilation because we find that it's terribly ineffective. We also find that it inhibits the likelihood of responders doing something. And that actually does include trained responders. Trained responders are less likely to do mouth to mouth or do anything if they feel like they have to do mouth to mouth. So just begin compressions just and the CPR class we took focused a whole lot on exactly how deep to go and the exact rate. And it turns out that's probably not as important as we think it is. If you obsess about that, then you're more likely to not do something. And we're way better if you do something than if you do nothing. So just put your hands in the middle of the chest, push deep and fast. So begin compression. So that's the number one thing is identify the cardiac arrest and then begin compressions. And in this scenario, you're out in the middle of nowhere. You're just not going to get help. There is no help available. Look to see if you can find some easily reversible causes. So Unfortunately, if they have an LAD occlusion and VFib, there are no easily reversible causes. Your CPR that you're doing is a bridge to something else, whether it's a bridge to reperfusion, whatever the bridge is, there's nothing you're going to get out there in the middle of Idaho as you're, you're hunting. So look for reversible things like, is this perhaps an airway obstruction? Were they eating a protein bar as you're out hunting? Can you clear the airway? So if you can clear the airway, do that. If this is a problem with the airway being occluded because of position, try to reposition the airway. And the way we do that is the head tilt chin lift where you just lift their chin up and tilt their head backwards a little bit. We will frequently worry ourselves to the point of inaction about, well, is it possible they had a spinal cord injury? So two things. In this scenario, you saw them drop. So the odds of a spinal cord injury are vanishingly small. And two... If they actually, let's say you didn't see them fall and they do have a spinal cord injury, the chances of you, of them living in this scenario are non-existent. So you're not going to make anything worse. So the odds are just go ahead and open the airway. Well, it just goes back to ABCs, right? Airway, exactly. breathing circulation. So Bingo. you're not where the S and spine is all the way down at S. <laughs> so stick with A, right. get that airway, make sure they're moving air. Bingo. And and that's really, well, and that's it. So I wouldn't worry in this situation about trying to move air for them because that's, that's a losing proposition. You're not going to be able to effectively do it in this environment. It's not like you have an oxygen cylinder and an ET tube and a bag valve mask. That's not available to you right now. So just don't worry about it at all. Open the airway if you think that's the problem. If it is trauma and uh, one of the other things that can cause traumatic cardiac arrest is blood loss. So you're out hunting. Did they accidentally shoot themselves? So I actually said camping. camping I'm in New I'm York. Sorry. You're in Texas. <laughs> so you I took said, the camping and turned it into hunting. And I think that's a product of our geographic cultural differences. But fine. No, camping, to do. we're yeah. going to run with it. Camping, totally. I mean, uh, hunting. We're hunting. We're well, hunting. so you're yes. out camping and, uh, you know, you have a knife there and yeah. you're trying to, I don't know, cut some rope and you manage to, you know, hit your femoral artery. So that's a potentially reversible cause of cardiac arrest. Now, the truth is, is if you've bled so much that you're in cardiac arrest, this is, again, a losing proposition. But try to stop the bleeding so that they don't get into that situation. And the way to do that, and this has changed a little bit since our pathologist graduated from residency 15 years ago, direct pressure is still great, but put a tourniquet on there. And the truth is, is if you're out camping, you probably should have a tourniquet anyway. I shocking to you as a Texan, I do hunt. And when I'm out <laughs> hunting, I carry a tourniquet with me. So from if there is bleeding, slap a tourniquet on. The damage we do with tourniquets that we worry about is really, really slim. The benefit is way higher. So over the past 20 years that we've been at war, we have learned an awful lot. And uh, one of the things that we learned is most preventable traumatic deaths are from hemorrhage, and we can control that with tourniquets. So if you have a tourniquet, use that. About the only other preventable or reversible cause a traumatic death, there might be a tension pneumothorax. And if you think, if you have a decent history that suggests 
attention pneumothorax. And in this situation, it's going to be pretty slim because if something creates an opening in the chest, that opening is probably still going to be there. You trip and land on your tent pole or something. But if you think perhaps there's a tension pneumothorax, you can relieve that. Uh, just poke a hole in the anterior chest wall and call it a day. It's probably not going to help. So where that ends up is you're out there in the middle of nowhere about the only thing you can do is compressions, try to open the airway. And if that doesn't resolve it, then it's probably nothing is going to work and they're going to die or remain dead, I guess is probably the better term. So one thing I didn't hear you mention is the precordial thump. And I just want to know, is there... Sure. Is it ever inappropriate to do a precordial thump? Because I, I would think maybe, you know, we were talking about epistaxis earlier, right? Yeah. patient has got a nosebleed, probably not a good idea to do a pre precordial thump. But I was thinking cardiac arrest, right? You want to put them back into yeah. rhythm somehow, right? Again, I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor, so I'm a little far <laughs> out, of my, a little, out of my depth. Sure. Is there ever a role for it? So the the idea behind the precordial thump it is it is you are creating – a sort of a miniature defibrillation, if you will. And if the patient did go into VFib in that scenario, you have a middle-aged guy who probably drinks too much, exercises too little and eats too much. Chances of a 50-year-old American dropping from coronary artery disease is probably pretty high. He clutches, his chest goes down. There's a decent chance that is a ventricular fibrillation arrest and defib is really what he needs. Well, you rapidly look to your left and right, look into the tent and realize you don't have an AED with you. The only thing you have is your fist. So sure, go ahead, give it a shot. The effectiveness of a precordial thump is pretty limited, but the downside, especially in that environment where really the only thing else you have is CPR, absolutely give it a shot. I would do it. I would probably realize that this is a Hail Mary, but I'll absolutely give it a shot. And just to, to remind you, the way you do it, it's not a John Travolta kind of thing. We <laughs> go way back and just stab the needle into what's your poor Emma Thurman's heart, Uma Thurman's heart. You put your elbow right on the xiphoid process and just forcibly drop your fist onto their chest wall. So there's no wind up involved. Okay. Well, that was a needle. And actually, one of my Correct. allergies. That's right. That's One of my right. allergist colleagues says his two least favorite movies are Hitch and that wasn't Reservoir Dogs, a Pulp Fiction because of that scene, right? Hitch is- I, I don't know the like, reason I didn't say He's like, Pulp face Fiction. got swollen and he took Benadryl. Yeah. And then the other is, yeah, you're going to need, no, your EpiPen doesn't go into your chest. <laughs> so right, get right. that idea. That. It's not going to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, mine is, there is a, I think it's a Sylvester Stallone. I think it's Sylvester Stallone where he was, uh, he's a paramedic and there are a bunch of firefighters who are down in a body of water, like in a tunnel and they're trying- Cliffhanger. Was that cliffhanger? Is that where he does the stand, handstand and defibrillates and everybody jumps up? <laughs> oh my God. It was just pain. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. I think, I think all of us have our particular painful Hollywood moment. I can't think of an ENT one. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> we're, we're never in the movies. That's why nobody's ever talking. <laughs> Oh, those lists, uh, we're, we're, never, we're never on there. All no, right. no love for the ENT. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned the AED, right? Yeah. So, so in the next scenario, we're actually going to have disposal to that. And again, for those of us who aren't practitioners that deal with cardiac arrest, we're still, we're still the doctor in the room. People are still going to be looking at us. So the next scenario, you're a hand surgeon, 20 years out from residency with an entirely outpatient practice. You're at the mall with your husband and son, picking out his bar mitzvah suit, right? Again, I'm in New York. <laughs> uh huh. This this is sounding <laughs> oddly specific. Yes. <laughs> Almost as though this may have happened to someone. When the tailor that's fitting your son for his suit suddenly clutches his chest and collapses. Okay. So same scenario as before, but now you're in the mall, and I'm assuming the mall has an AED or an automatic external defibrillator. Yeah, let's hope. Let's hope. So that is an interesting tangent to go off on, by the way, about <laughs> whether public places will have AEDs. It's a, a fight. As an EMS medical director, I get in all the time. Oh, I thought whether 13-year-olds should really be having tailored suits. Okay. So they, they <laughs> in public places. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what? Uh, so my, my 13-year-old did not get a tailored suit. I will <laughs> definitely tell you that. He's 18 and did not get one. No, the public access defibrillation, there are, there's a university somewhere in Texas, let me just put it this way, who does not 
believe in AEDs. They feel like having, it's not that they don't believe the science, but their lawyer thinks having an AED publicly accessible will expose them to liability. And I think exactly the opposite. I think if you took someone off of the street, you hop on the subway in Manhattan and you ask someone, hey, if somebody goes into cardiac arrest, do you want one of those AED things? And should the subway have one? I think most people are going to expect that that is there. And if that it's is not there. Remarkable uh, to me that that type of policy yeah. is being determined with that type of reasoning. Not The reasoning yep. isn't, are we more or less likely to save a life if we have this here? Or are we more or less likely to expose ourselves to liability? Right. That's Absolutely. How, where, where are we in this country where that's how we're making these decisions? Well, I think we all know where we are. But Exactly. Okay. <laughs> I, I would suspect that's a different podcast. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure there are podcasts solely about that. So, yeah. okay. But let's say, let's say there is an AED at your, yeah. at your disposal. Yeah. So, so what do you do now? So in this situation, you are, the priorities are the same as they were out in the wilderness. You just have more resources available. So when they drop, the first thing you do is uh, determine if they're responsive and if if they are breathing normally. If the answer to those is no, because people have been known to trip and you know they don't really need an AED or CPR. But if they are not responding and not breathing normally, then have someone else, your 13-year-old son would be a great person to do because Lord knows he's going to have a cell phone. Call 911 and then find an AED. And while he's doing that, you've assigned him to go do that. You get on the chest and begin CPR. Press hard, fast, and do not stop. So we didn't talk about this much with the last scenario, but let me hit briefly on this because Wait, this- Before you go on, I just want to yeah. point out something that you said that I think is actually critical. Sure. Is that you didn't say someone call 911. You didn't say someone get the AED. You actually Correct. gave a specific person a specific task. And I think in this scenario, it's, it's it's important to point out the necessity of doing something like that, especially when you're not surrounded by trained professionals, right? You're, you're going to be surrounded by people who are panicking. And oddly enough, having being surrounded by trained professionals doesn't change it either. So there you are in a level one trauma center with trained people everywhere. And if you say something like, I need to put a chest tube and get me a setup, aside from the fact that it should have been there to begin with, you're going to have a whole lot of people who know what a chest tube is, know what a chest tube setup is, and assume someone else is going to get it. So this is a function of the limitation in this system is that we're dealing with humans who behave in a human-like fashion. So you absolutely have to assign someone that task. They'd be more than happy to do it, but the default human assumption, our psychology, is that someone else is going to do it. So yeah, directly assign someone to dial 911 and track down an AED. Now, depending on where you are, again, if you're in a mall in Manhattan, you are, I don't know, does Manhattan have malls? That seems like a non-Manhattan kind of thing. Yeah, there is. There, there is near Penn Station. Ah, but, but very good. Yeah. But so it's, if you're there, if you're in Penn Station, for example, you're when you call 911, it's going to go to what's called a PSAP, a public safety answering point. And there are going to be trained dispatchers there who have a remarkable amount of technology. One of the things they have, or I'm assuming Fire Department New York has this a listing of where all the AEDs are. So as they're, they're not really entering the location in because it comes up automatically, they should get notified of where the AED is and can tell your son where to go. But if not, he goes to find the AED. You get on the chest and begin CPR. So what I didn't mention earlier, when you're out there in the woods, where honestly probably nothing is going to help and you're treating yourself more than the patient, is don't interrupt the compressions. So what we learn is when you begin compressions, you have a actual blood flow doesn't, there's a pressure wave that you have to build and it takes multiple compressions to build a pressure wave to the point where you're actually perfusing. So it's not that you're perfusing with the first beat and that's, or the first compression. And that's really important. It takes like momentum. Exactly. And it takes 20 to 30 seconds to actually get to the point, 20 to 30 seconds of good compressions to get to the point where you're perfusing. And then as soon as you interrupt those compressions, that pressure wave drops off and you need another 20, 30 seconds to build it up. So the key here is minimal interruptions or minimally interrupted cardiocerebral resuscitation, which is really what we're aimed at. So get on the chest, deep fast and don't stop until help shows up. 
really in this situation, this is an imminently salvageable patient in a modern U.S. city. So don't interrupt the compressions. So hopefully help will show up quickly. What we're looking for here is getting the AED on as quickly as we can. And if you don't know how to operate an AED, don't worry about it. You open, all you have to figure out how to do is open the box up. When you open the box up, almost any AED that's used in public access is going to have voice prompts and it will tell you what to do. There will be a set of pads there and it will tell you to attach the pads and then there's a nice pretty picture Okay, plus or minus pretty. There's a picture that tells you where to put the pads. Put the pads on there and follow the directions. And that's really about it. When it says get out of the way, then get out of the way. (laughs) Otherwise, do compressions. Now, if you have some help, what you should do is organize a transfer of compression. So have your kneeling, say, on the patient's right-hand side, and you're doing compressions, pushing hard, deep, fast in the center of the chest, have someone else, some other bystander on the other side, on the patient's left and around every 200 compressions switch out and just have them hover their hands over yours. And as soon as you back out, they start compressing. And the reason you do this is because of rescue or fatigue. So there's some pretty good research that shows even, you know, your 19 year old CrossFit firefighter, just the quality of their compressions drops after a while, no matter how good a shape you're in. So don't try to to be tough. Don't try to be tough. Recognize that you're not doing the patient any favors by saying, no, 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 I'm in great shape. I can, I can do this forever. You can't, even if you think you are, you're not, and you're not doing them any favors. Bingo. Absolutely. So get on the chest, ask for help, determine unresponsiveness and that they're not breathing normally. Get on the chest, ask for an AED. Don't come off of the chest until you have someone else who is there to replace you or the AED says, get off the chest so we can analyze the rhythm. And that's about it. So the other thing, well, let's, let's say this. So in New York, what's going to happen is EMS is going to show up or the police officer or someone else, the firefighter who shows up because there's a, an organized stimic when they show up, give them a very brief report. And then the key thing here is they're the expert, not you get out of their way. Yeah, and I think most of us that deal with things that are completely mm-hmm. different from this are going to have no problem recognizing that we're not the expert in the room. Yeah, absolutely. So I get out of the way when I am in that situation. Even when it is paramedics I direct, I get out of the way. But that's definitely been my experience is that uh, there are a lot of very well-meaning physicians here. They do exactly what you said. They look around. Nobody else is there. So they feel an ethical obligation to help. And then as soon as help gets there, they are more than willing to get out of the way, uh, just like I would be in a different situation. Absolutely. So for the first scenario, you were, you were pretty clear about what the odds are in terms of yeah. actually this patient Absolutely. surviving. But the second scenario, mm-hmm. I'm not giving you any information in terms of their medical history, their sure. risk factors, anything, but just all comers. What are we yeah. talking about in terms of survival for, for this patient if we're the the first responder on the scene. You bet. So all all cause mortality from cardiac arrest is around 90%. So about 10% of all out of hospital cardiac arrest with a with the system that can respond will survive. So that's pretty bleak, but it's better than zero that it was out in the camping in the Adirondacks. So what differentiates that 10%? So it really varies widely based on the important things like, was there bystander CPR that dramatically increased? I think the odds ratio for a meaningful survival with bystander CPR is about three. So a 200% increase in the odds of survival. Public access defibrillation, was there a defibrillator available prior to EMS arrival? If a lawyer hadn't gotten in the way? Correct. Correct. I don't know what the the odds ratio is, but it's in the neighborhood of two, somewhere in that area. Then obviously, if this was a shockable rhythm, so the odds of survival are greater in a shockable rhythm than in a non-shockable rhythm. And if you think about it, in the United States, we have determined that no one dies without CPR. Uh, I think kind of unfortunate but that's now what we consider. So if you're responding to a nursing home and you have a 90 year old woman who's cachectic and has been having a fever and so three days of sepsis when they walk in the room and realize that she's in cardiac arrest, 
that's clearly going to lower the odds of survival. Your tailor, on the other hand, who is up doing a wonderful tailoring job, because I'm sure the <laughs> bar mitzvah suit's going to be gorgeous, clutches his chest and goes to the ground. His odds of survival, let's say you're in Seattle, Washington, your odds there, they're, they're very proud of their success rate. And about 40 to 50% of that scenario of those patients will leave the hospital neurologically intact. So clearly a big difference between that and 10%. But overall across the nation, the best data that we have is from something called CARES or the Cardiac Arrest Registry to Enhance Survival. It's a national but voluntary registry of -of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And that of those, the people who voluntarily participate, overall success rate, all causes, all rhythms is 10%. All right. Well, so then we won't hold ourselves personally accountable for the uh, the outcome there if we happen to be the first first responder although we now we know what our what our priorities are and and the Absolutely. order that we do things i i do think that that is an important point that we those of us who ems this is really what we do out of hospital cardiac arrest is this is a big part of our specialty and we have to understand that death has a really bad prognosis. So cardiac arrest, even though there are quite a few patients that we can help, overall, we shouldn't be surprised if they, they're not resuscitated. Now, going back to your particular scenario, when we see him drop, our assumption should be that he will be able to survive uh, because that specific scenario really suggests a, a witnessed ventricular fibrillation arrest. And I think our assumption in general should be that it will, but then when we're yeah, exactly. in retrospect, yeah. you shouldn't be taking personal responsibility for the for the outcome after you did exactly. everything that you you could have done. Because you have to think of it like I greatly Absolutely. increased this person's Absolutely. likelihood of survival, yeah. even though they didn't. So correct. There is there is one more scenario, and I'm not sure if we should go into it. I plan at some point to have a podcast about medical emergencies on an airplane. Yeah. So again, you're the you're you're a radiologist on an airplane and and they call you with an emergency. Right. But I'm not sure what they have on the plane that they that they would in addition to an AED. Are you familiar right. with what they have on there? What is there? I tried to look for it, but I couldn't find it. It more I got directed towards what you're what medical supplies you're allowed to bring on a plane. But what, what <laughs> right. are the standard medical supplies that are on an airplane? Are you familiar with that? So I'm not terribly familiar. So fortunately, my experience with the in-flight emergencies has been a stroke, which wasn't a whole lot I could do anyway. So it does vary based on domestic and international. They have more equipment on international flights and they all flights should have, particularly American carriers, and I think most of the, the airlines that any of us would feel comfortable getting on is going to have an AED. They will probably have a source of oxygen. They'll probably have an EpiPen. Um, after, they'll probably have some oral medications that aren't going to be a whole lot of help in, in a cardiac arrest scenario. But they should have the things that you need, which really is an AED, and maybe a source of oxygen and a way to deliver it. So that scenario, though, the, there are a couple things that I'll say. Number one is, let's say it's not a cardiac arrest, and you're trying to determine, you're feeling really bad, you're looking around, there are 300 people squished in like sardines. None of them want to divert. Wait, and, wait, let me, let, me, let me go through my scenario then, because I yeah. thought it was funny. So my opportunity to tell a joke. So Absolutely. Okay, go for so it. So you're let's a neuroradiologist, one year out from residency, and you're on a flight home from a conference. Okay. They call asking for a doctor on board. Nobody gets up. You're looking around. Still nobody. The flight attendant comes up to you, and now you're remembering that when you filled out the form, you filled out doctor when you signed up, just like you did on your license plate and just like you did on your Tinder profile. Uh, So they grab you. You arrive on the scene. Well, and you're probably in scrubs too, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Good point. Good point. Okay. So why don't you tell me now what, what you want to talk us through? What you, so you arrive on the scene. What are we seeing? You bet. So step one, go back and change your Tinder profile and, and change <laughs> those things. Realize that maybe everyone on the planet knowing you're a doctor is a bad thing. Yeah. So what you'll do is you will, so you get up and head back from your first class seat to, I don't know if you've seen it. There actually is a Dog MD sketch where Darth Vader or Doc Vader discusses this exact thing. He's not in first class. He's on Spirit Airlines because that's all he can afford with his student. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. If you're in first class, then clearly you haven't read The White Coat Investor. So <laughs> Exactly. Correct. Right. So you get up, go find the patient, and they're more than likely still going to be in their seat. You determine their unresponsiveness and the fact that they're not breathing normally, and you get them down onto the floor. Fortunately, I've never done CPR in an aircraft. All I can think of is this ain't going to, there's no room. At least in the aircraft I fly, there's not a whole lot of room try to get them back to a place where there's some room to work and ask the flight attendant to get the medical kit. It may be a bit of a surprise to find out what's in it, but there should be an AED there and the flight attendant should know how to use the AED. Get the patient to the back. And by the way, the flight attendants know how to do CPR too, so they probably will already have started this. But your priorities are going to be the same. The minimally interrupted CPR. Initially, even if you have a bag valve mask and oxygen, I would not worry about it. Initially, what you need to do is establish CPR and get the AED on and see if it's a shockable rhythm. If it is a shockable rhythm, and the way you'll determine that, don't worry about having to interpret the ECG. If the machine says shock, then push the shock button or get out of the way and let it shock itself, depending on which one it will do. And the machine will let you know what the options are. So defibrillation, and let's say you're a long way from, let's say it's domestic, but it's still going to take you an hour to get down to help. The key things that are going to reverse this arrest, and let's assume it's a, a witnessed V-fib arrest, is good CPR and defibrillation. So let me help do a little cognitive offloading here, and let me tell you what the science says about all the other stuff that we do. We debate them. Well, this is great. Let me really help you with this because that's not going to help. There is mixed evidence comparing intubation to other like blind insertion airway devices. There have been two recent large randomized control trials that basically said there is neither one of them found an advantage to endotracheal intubation. Both of them found that you'll be just fine doing a blind insertion device that's easier to use. And one of them actually found that the blind insertion device has a 2.8% improved mortality. So don't worry about intubating. Even what if is a blind? Is, is that like an LMA? It is. So the, the classic examples are an LMA and they're different versions of LMAs. So the one we use is an eye gel. But if you look at it, you would go, that's an LMA. So absolutely. LMAs, there are also things that are called uh, king airways which look fundamentally different than an LMA. They have two. They're designed to go down just past the trachea into the esophagus, occlude the esophagus. And then they have a larger balloon in the oral pharynx. And then there are fenestrations around or an opening right around in between the two balloons. So theoretically, you've obstructed the esophagus and obstructed the oropharynx. And when you ventilate, the air goes out in between the balloons and the... if It's got nowhere Netter, else to go. The path of yeah. least resistance is... According to yeah. Netter, it's yeah. going to go into the trachea, theoretically. So that's called a King LT. And there are some older versions that are slightly different, but those are about the only things you'll see is some version of an LMA or a King LT too. So just for those who, who aren't familiar, haven't been in the OR for a while, LMA is laryngeal mask airway. And it's basically, it looks a bit like a triangle or like a small mask and yeah, it just absolutely. sits on top of the trachea, or sorry, it sits on top of the larynx, laryngeal mask airway, and and uh, and you can ventilate that way. Sometimes we use it in the operating room, but if the anesthesiologist really wants to have better control of the airway, you're gonna you're gonna intubate. So, but it but it is it is a great option. They're fairly easy to put in. Abs absolutely, the training requirements are less. It really works well. And one of the interesting things here is you would assume that aspiration in a patient without a possible cardiac arrest, the risk is going to be high. And I will absolutely tell you it is high. But you would assume that you would have more things like aspiration pneum pneumonitis from a patient managed with a LMA compared to an ET tube. And neither one of those two studies found that. So the two studies, by the way, one was called paramedic two, and that was endotracheal intubation versus an eye gel, a type of, and that doesn't stand for anything, by the way, that's just the name of it. Uh, that's a type of LMA. And then PART, P-A-R-T, was an American multi-center randomized control trial using the King LT compared to endotracheal intubation. It does not appear that uh, aspiration risk is any higher. And even, even if it were, I think one thing I remember from being an ENT intern is one of our books said, it's much easier to revise a trach scar than it is to bring back the dead. So if you think you need to do an emergent tracheostomy, then just do it. Same idea. It's much easier to treat aspiration pneumonia than it is to bring, up, bring back the dead. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yep. So, and I don't know, you're probably not going to have that option, by the way. Probably the only option you'll have is a back valve mask. And if once you have done CPR and then defibrillated or given the AED a chance to shock, maybe there's not a, a shockable rhythm, those are the things that are going to matter. At some point, you're going to need to ventilate, but it's around six minutes into the code. So it's not an urgent priority. And there are lots of reasons for that, but probably not worth getting into. If you do have to ventilate, the one thing that I would recommend making a mask seal is don't think that you're going to be able to do it with one hand and one person. Get some help and have one person squeeze the bag for you. And please, for the love of all that is holy, squeeze gently and slowly. Uh, you don't want to breathe more than 10 times a minute. And in this situation, I can almost guarantee you that you're going to be trying to squeeze that bag around 60 times a minute. And you may think that's an exaggeration, but that number actually came from watching trained respiratory therapists in trauma rooms with trauma resuscitations and directly observing what their rate was. It turns out that our hand that's squeezing that bag seems to have a direct connection to our adrenal gland and we just get amped up and, and squeeze too fast. So try to intentionally squeeze the bag once every say six seconds and then have someone else make a seal because if you're not an anesthesiologist, honestly, if you're not an anesthesiologist in an OR, you are likely just to occlude the airway more than you are to open it with one person. So try to have one person doing compressions, one person holding the seal, another person slowly, gently squeezing the bag. So don't worry so much about ventilation early. That's what I'm trying to say. The next thing that you may worry about is, well, I have to get IV access. Turns out you don't. There are other ways to get drugs into patients, and we'll come back to the drugs in a second. But on some of these international flights, you may have some IV catheters, but you also may have a little thing that looks like a drill. And that's an interosseous drill, and those are incredibly easy to use and effective. So there's some decent data that says they're just as effective with IVs just as fast. So if you have to get IV access, great, go ahead and do it. But if you are not able to, Really don't worry about it because the drugs that we would typically use in this patient. So what would those be? So let's say antiarrhythmics. Well, it turns out there was a really nice study that compared amiodarone to lidocaine to placebo in patients with witnessed V-fib cardiac arrest. No difference. So none of those antiarrhythmics worked any better than placebo. Wow. So don't worry about the antiarrhythmics epinephrine is the big thing. We have all taken ACLS and know that we had the 10 commandments and one of the 11th commandment was thou shalt give epinephrine. And it turns out in cardiac arrest, that data was based on some dogs in 1906. There was a paper by guys named Krill and Dooley and they killed dogs. They asphyxiated them and gave them some epinephrine and voila, they got pulses back. And we didn't need any more evidence than that. We just adopted it and kept doing it. There was a very large study. And I'm sorry, I said earlier on, I just realized I said something silly when I was talking about the British study of the IGEL versus ETI. That was Airways 2, not Paramedic 2. So Paramedic 2 was the study of epinephrine versus placebo in cardiac arrest. And epinephrine got more pulses back, but it also got more neurologically devastated survivors back. And I don't think that's the business any of us are in. So if you're not able to get access and give epinephrine, don't worry about it because it's really not, it's not nearly as important as doing good compressions and getting defibrillation there. On top of the fact that these airlines have someone at their disposal that's going to be talking you through these scenarios. Yes. Right? Like yes. You're, you act as educated, mm -hmm. skilled eyes, ears, and hands, but Correct. you are not going to be alone in this scenario. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there are some some legal things to understand. We're used to being the the captain of the ship, so to speak, where we're the one in charge. The rules are absolutely different in an aircraft because there actually is a captain of the ship. He sits in the captain's seat, and there's a reason they call him captain. He is legally in charge of everything that occurs on that aircraft, including medicine. So if he tells you that for what – he and he's not going to do this, or she – they're not going to try to dictate your medicine, but they will put you in contact with a base station, and they're able to do that basically anywhere on the planet. They can put you in contact with physicians who are trained.
trained in, in these types of responses and they'll give you advice and figure out what you have. But ultimately, they, when, you, when it comes down to, geez, do I want to make all of these people uncomfortable and delay them by having to divert down? Don't worry about that. That's the captain's decision. Yeah, that's um, not your responsibility. No, no. And that captain will have no problem making that decision. We covered quite a bit. This was very, very helpful, actually. Now I'm going to be able to go to the mall and go on a plane with a lot less anxiety than I did previously. <laughs> but is there anything else, and this is very comprehensive, but is there anything else that you think that bears mentioning that we haven't discussed so far? Really, I think that the key parts to cardiac arrest is realize that this is a, a team-based resuscitation. All of us are part of a team and in society outside of your camping trip. We have got to activate the system. So early recognition, early activation of the system, early minimally interrupted chest compressions with early defibrillation is what makes a difference. None of the other stuff that we're taught about makes any difference. So just offload your, your mind about any of that and focus on good compressions and getting an AED there. Great. Great. Well, Dr. Jeff Jarvis, where can people find you online? Where can they find your podcast? So I have a podcast that reviews EMS research. It's called the EMS Lighthouse Project Podcast. It's on iTunes, SoundCloud, other places. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Jeff Jarvis. And that's not Jeff Jarvis. That's a TV critic. And it's not Prof. Jeff Jarvis, which is the best I can tell somebody who exists to to troll the TV critic. So it's at Dr. Jeff Jarvis. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, was, we'll make sure that was, that was my exposure to Twitter is getting confused with those guys. Yeah. But, <laughs> All right. Well, we'll make sure we can tell the difference between you. All right. Well, thank you again for taking the time out of your day to, to, to talk to us and to teach us about how to handle uh, cardiac arrest when, when there's nobody else around. Dr. Block, I really appreciate you having me on the show. Thank you. All right. It's been a pleasure. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.